they can be paying up to the top end of 7 to 8k, up to mm. 9k for a fresh grad. Uh, software engineer. I'm in the wrong industry. I should have dropped out of business school, went to computer science or computer studies. Oh it's not too late. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to Hatch and Hustle, a podcast where we talk about everything entrepreneurship, startups, and share some of our craziest experiences. In today's episode, we have Ying Chong together with us, who is the co-founder of Glintz, and we'll be talking about the job market in Singapore and how he built Glintz to become a regional company. All right. So hi, Ying Tong. Thank Hello. you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Maybe you could share with us a little bit about yourself first sure. before we learn more about Glintz as well. Yeah, th thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm Ying Chong. You can call me YC. That's how everyone calls me. Um, so I used to be the CTO of Glintz. Okay. I recently, we recently brought on someone who was um, from Big Tech China oh, to take over because I, I sort of realized I was still hitting a plateau in my uh, where I was able to manage. So I recently took up the head of labs um, role at Glintz. So a little bit about what Glintz does. So we are a regional recruitment platform, meaning that any company that wants to hire and build a team in Southeast Asia, uh, that's where we help them to hire. Interestingly, I've actually met YC and oh, yeah. Oslo yes. in 2016. I remember you traded to your office. Your office was up on a hill. Yeah. It was like 10, 15 <laughs> people. Uh, but it was a super green flag because I would say that, look, these guys are prudent. Yeah. Mm. Where was this again? This was, a, this was at a one off area. So it's like oh. a very random out of the way place because rent was expensive and mm. we were like on doing Series A back then. Yeah. And congratulations for the success. You know, it's been a ride since we've invested previously. Yeah, lots of ups and downs since then. So, yeah. yeah. So what, what do you exactly do as head of labs? Good question, good question. So I, I, I now lead up the Vietnam marketplace, right? So Glintz, we have been building uh, in mostly in Indonesia for the past, I would say, eight, nine years. That's our major market. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of have a platform for every regional market in, in Southeast Asia. But we realized that Vietnam is actually going really, really fast, right? So we wanted someone to be dedicated to the Vietnam marketplace. So, so that's where I come in, right? I come in and sort of look at what the market needs and try to iterate the team towards a product that fits the market. Right. Yeah. Maybe in terms of numbers, could you give us a sense of how you know, big Glintz has become? Yeah, sure. So we have been around since 2015, right? About eight years now. We are at around 800 employees. Wow. Which is, uh, <laughs> astounds me sometimes. Oh, <laughs> that's that's an awesome. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Well done. So we are, and then we are in about six different markets in Southeast Asia. Mm. Yeah. 800 employees? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can't imagine that. That's crazy. It, it, it scares me too. Speaking <laughs> the location, like how many in tech, how many in other operational roles? Yeah. Look like? so, so I mentioned at Glintz, we do recruitment and we have two lines of business, right? So one is the, the job platform, mm -hmm. right? So there's this sort of like job street, but for the modern age on mobile, mm -hmm. right? Then we also have the offline recruitment business. Because there are certain roles that companies really just can't find on mm -hmm. online, right? So they turn to our recruiters to help, right? So that recru the recruitment uh, piece, that's where we hire the bulk of our people, right? That's about four or five hundred. Right. And then we have about a couple hundred for operations, marketing, uh, BD and everything. Mm -hmm. our, our engineering team is around 40 people, right? So okay. that's a small, small team. Mm -hmm. Going back to 2015, how did this idea come about? Wow, so I actually, I actually dropped out of school for, for this startup. Right, so, it's so ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my, what my parents think. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah no, Asian no, parents, no, no, no. <laughs> no but it's, isn't it funny that like people go to university for employment and you went to university, dropped out to create employment opportunities for people? <laughs> Don't you find it a bit ironic <laughs> in that sense? <laughs> There's actually a logic to this. So, so I, 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 we actually started, both me and my co-founder Oswald, we started out interning at different companies during NS. So the funny thing is, uh, in I, NS, yeah, that's an early start. I know, wow. I know, I know. We were sort of like moonlighting and uh, <laughs> at that period. <at> <laughs> <career. laughs> but I, I taught, I taught like my ligament during my officer training, mm. so that gave me like a good eight months to really like explore mm. different, mm. different like internships, right? And I realized I learned the most through internships. Mm. Like compared to six years of education, that three months of internship just taught me a lot more about how to work with people, right? And then we hit on this idea, that insight that internships really is the key to helping young people gain real world skills. Yeah. So we started off with an internship portal, right? Is this how I first actually used or tried Glintz before? Oh, like right. So I think that was so many you're an early ago. customer. I think so, early, so, yes. And then how do you decide, when do you think it was the right time for you to scale up beyond the internship pool to, you know, um, wider scopes and other jobs too? 
Yeah, we, we were on the internship portal for about one to two years mm -hmm. and we, we really quickly realized that there's no market for it. Like no one's going to pay for an intern. It's good as a free website, yep. right? But no one's going to pay and no investor's going to fund us to do anything at all, right? In the internship market. Mm -hmm. So we quickly realized that we have to branch out into full-time roles. But full-time roles in Singapore, um, it's a very competitive market. It's like a red ocean, right? And and I remember going for a, um, an investor meeting and this investor just straight up told us, if you don't go to Indonesia in the next four weeks, we're just going to pull out investment. Four weeks? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, going back to Ben, right? So why did you invest? Yeah, so when we looked at Glint's, we actually debated hard on whether internship as a market was monetizable. So back then when you invest, <laughs> the internship piece was still the... It was a concern already. Thing. Okay. But when we looked at you guys, we knew that the founders would find a way. Wow! <laughs> so it's really That's a people so this, like yeah, it's about people, the people right? I think part of the reason was because we, we, we dropped out, right? So we had no other options than to make this work. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, honestly, if I hadn't dropped out, if I went through, because I, I went to a school in, in, in US, right? If I know I have like multiple job opportunities lined up, I would have maybe dropped this idea maybe two years in mm. because it didn't take off for a good three to four years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so, we were pushing you to be full-time yes. founders as yes. well. Correct. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so, so I say I dropped out, right? That's a simple headline story, but the reality is a little more complex. So I was slated to go to university, like I would say in August. So I ORD in December, there's a good eight months before I go to university. So we went for an accelerated program called GFDI. It's, it's no longer around now, but it was such a helpful program for young entrepreneurs like us back then, where they really just put us through this car wash of polishing our pitch for investors. Wow. Okay. So we went through this thing not knowing what it might end up. We didn't even know what a seed fund was, right? A seed round was. We just went through thinking that, okay, this is a project that we did. I actually started this because I needed it for my college application. So there was, <laughs> yeah, a, there was a ironies of ironies irony, in life, yeah. right? So, so I, you needed like a cool <laughs> idea to be like, oh, a founder exactly. and a student. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because I was uh, supplied for uh, the, uh, a business school. So I needed an idea to like write about. So we went in as a project, but we came out just going through the motions, doing pitches to investors, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them was like GEC along the way. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of on the fence like, okay, should we drop out or should we not? We thought we could just run this alongside university. And I actually went to school for a good, I would say one semester, a good three, three to four months. Right. And both were failing, right? My studies was failing mm -hmm. and, and, and the startup was failing, right? Mm -hmm. So part of that, what the investors said and also GC that Bennett was part of, right? Was that we have to make a decision, right? Mm -hmm. Either you go to school and do that full time and drop this idea, or you do this Glint's thing full time, right? right? And there's no looking back either way. Wow. So I, I spent a good two months, you know, just trying to deliberate, call my parents, and That's so <laughs> yeah, eventually decided. Oh so between you and your co-founder, who's the one who's like, okay, I'm gonna drop out first, or like make the decision, or was it like a very mutual thing to do it together? And like you die, I die, <laughs> we die together. The funny thing was he, for him, it was a straightforward decision. Oh, the, really? the moment the investor said, okay, you do this full time, he was like, oh yeah, right, I'm going to do this full time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, he was decided already. What was holding you back in terms of the decision? Well, I was, uh, I was on this uh, complicated arrangement called a scholarship bond. Oh, <laughs> very complicated tricky. indeed. I missed out that important detail. Yeah, you probably yeah. missed out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, very complicated. So it was yeah. very expensive to pay off the bond. Fairly, fairly, for, for a fresh grad uh, wow. at that point. Do your parents support? My parents did. They were, I mean, to this day, I'm still very grateful for them for that. Um, the lucky thing was I dropped out after one semester. So it hasn't accumulated to something yes. that's like, yeah. you know, crazy. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. You know, speaking about employment and job market, right? Um, how's the landscape like? Because I feel like this is one of the hottest topics mm -hmm. that's going on right now, right? With so many tech layoffs and people struggling to get a job. Um, even for like master students or those with like insane yeah. track record on their CV. Yeah. What's it like now? So I've been the CTO for the past, you know, the first six to seven years of Glint's, right? And it has always been a, a challenge to hire, right? As a startup, you are fighting against the, the big the giants, right? Facebook and everyone. So we have never been ever, ever been like able to just easily attract good talent. We have to like actively go out and source. Mm. I still remember in 2021, it was quite crazy. Like uh, software engineer salaries went up by, I would say 50% across 50%. the market. 50%? Yeah. 50%. Whoa. And we have engineers who told us, hey, this is what the market is going. If you're not going to match it, 
I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to leave, right? <laughs> so, so there was this whole pressure where in the mid-year, we have to like do an urgent recalibration of salary. So it was super stressful for me. Mm. Um, I would say this year is different, right? So this year has changed quite a fair bit, right? Uh, the market is much tougher now. Um, all the, even the giants are laying off. And I, I had a friend who is working at Meta, right? So he first joined Meta because uh, he thought it was going to be an easy and comfy job. Mm. And it was for the first two, three years, right? But in the past one year, he said, well, it's getting tough, right? Uh, and my, I might as well just consider doing a startup on my own, right? So, so it's, not, it's, it's getting quite difficult even for software engineers to, mm. to get employment at these big companies. Do you think it's a good thing though, like it's a market correction which is overdue? Or do you think it's not a good thing? I, as a startup founder, I think it's an absolutely <laughs> great thing. <laughs> I mean, we're just, I know, yeah. we were just chatting a little bit before, before this, right? And we were, we were saying that uh, these smaller companies are starting to be able to get a, you know, access to this talent who has never been, you know, even interested in looking at us, right? So recently, I've been interviewing some engineers who, you know, interned at, at Meta before, and now they are also considering small, smaller companies. Yeah. So as a whole, I think it's, it's great for, the whole ecosystem because how many like smart people do you want to be like optimizing and advertising mm. uh, business model right mm. versus all these different areas of industries that you could actually innovate in right so i think it's a net net a good thing for now well, i think on the flip side if yeah. you're an employee and you're yeah. being restructured i think it's very tough yeah. so speaking from experience in uh, 2010 while working for an investment bank a global financial crisis happened yeah mm. and there was a whole load of us being restructured out and me included so the first thing is that you got a very mixed bag of emotions. Yeah. Mm. You know, you feel disappointed, you feel embarrassed, you feel scared, you feel lost. Mm. So I think, you know, when looking back, the first thing I did was try to paper and pen some of these emotions down. Because you mm. don't know what to feel. It was really a mixed True. bag. So you start asking, why am I needing to be embarrassed about? There's nothing wrong I did. Yeah. And then you start working through those emotions. And yeah. eventually, you also have this opportunity to take a step back. To think about, hey, you know, what do you want to do next? And one thing coming out of that is that, hey, I want to be more certain of my own future mm. and I want to kind of take more control. Hence, coming back to your point, you said some yeah. of your friends are thinking about entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I think lastly is that, yeah. you know, you shouldn't have uh, the fear of going out to ask your friends for help. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's what the social support is for. Mm. Your friends, your family, your industry colleagues. Because at one point, I was actually hiding at home. I didn't want to go out. Mm. Right? Right, right? But right, yeah. I think you'll be amazed how much people want to help. Yeah. So I think as an employee, you know, you can work through it. Yes. Yeah. I thought it was very what was very moving and I saw LinkedIn recently was when Grab did a huge layoff recently. Yeah. A lot of Grab alumni uh, who have probably left for a few years, they started doing um, online lists of all the people from Grab who are looking mm. for, like, ex-Grab who are looking for jobs. Right. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's, they are very employable people. So they made a whole list where um, other firms can have more spotlight on finding all these people who got laid off um, for a second opportunity. So I thought yeah. that was quite moving to see. And, and these are people who who, the people who initiated this movement were not even in Grab already. They just wanted to help their fe fellow juniors in the company. Mm. Yeah. So I see, I graduated about a year and a half ago and I remember getting different offer letters and the yeah. um, salary range is like huge. Mm. So at this yes. current climate, what is the entry level salary like? Mm. Yeah, so it depends. It varies from um, role to role and industry to industry. The one I'm most intimately familiar with is uh, software engineering. So we are, I mean, looking at around four to five thousand dollars, right, for a fresh grad engineer. Oh right? my goodness! <laughs> is, is that the uh, <laughs> higher end of like based on industry? So the software engineering uh, is, uh, salary industry is quite interesting. I would say there are like, if you map it out on the distribution graph, right, there are like two hums, right. Mm -hmm. So you have you have the the, the growth stage startups. Right, that, that is like, and, and then you have the SMEs and also the smaller companies, that's mm -hmm. one hump. And then you have the big tech companies, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another like distribution. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you if you are going to the bigger companies, like your fang companies, as well as like the fang like companies, right? Like Bike Dance, for instance, has been hiring extremely aggressively in Singapore. They, they can be paying up to the top end of seven to eight K, up mm -hmm. to nine K for a fresh bread. Uh, software engineer. I'm in the wrong industry. I should have oh. jumped out of business school, went to computer science or computer studies. Oh it's not too late. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Besides tech, what are some other industries which pay very well? Hmm. I would say actually um, marketing roles, right? Uh, that, that has been 
that's been going strong still, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I was my observation from the companies that we have been working with, the first role that they tend to cut, right, or to reduce hiring on is more operational or GNA roles, right? General admin roles. Right? But then for marketing and sales, where you're directly contributing to the top line, mm -hmm. uh, they are still they are still keeping that that position. I'm gonna stand up for finance a bit here. <laughs> 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 okay, I mean, there's always like buy side, sell side in finance roles. And yeah. I think junior investment banking analysts also earn about 8 to 10k. Right, and I'm right. so surprised that the tech is catching up, to be honest. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the reason that it's 8 to 10k is because the deal size are big. So, for example, if you're an investment bank and you're trying to close the transaction, it's about $500 million. Right. There's a 2% kind of fee generated by the investment bank. Mm. So, that's about $10 million. In a year, you do maybe three deals. And right. the team is very small. Mm. So you got analysts, you got associate, an AVP, and two directors. Wow. So imagine five people sharing $30 million with the bank. Right. So I think right. in general, banking is still quite an exciting sector, guys. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Not just tech. Tech is sexy, that's why. Yeah. You know, lifestyle, you have fancy offices, nice pantry, bean bags. Yeah, finance. But finance is not bad as well. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen Just like a shift there. like of what, what you are looking for, like going more from the conventional industries like investment banking, consulting into like tech because it's sexier, better optics uh, recently, or has yeah. it still been very well distributed? So finance and law, I think those are and and, and medical you. professions. <laughs> those are like your 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 golden collar sort of roles, mm -hmm. right? Where traditionally like it's been very popular. Um, but I've also been observing like at the undergrad level, a lot of parents are even pushing their kids to study computer science. Wow. Yeah. And one very concrete way you can see this is, uh, I, I have a tech lead, right, who, came, who comes from NUS. So he mentioned that eight years ago, you could get into uh, computer science with uh, a B or a C, right? It's no, not that is. hot. Yeah, it's not that hot uh, major. Yeah. But right now, you need to be like the top of your cohort to get mm. in, right? So you can see that the demand has really, really searched. For computer science. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Speaking of your NUS check lead, right? In yeah. NUS, at the start, everybody were only looking at um, investment banking or consulting jobs, um, especially in business school. Yeah. And then, but when it came down to it, after doing a few internships, a lot of people moved to like tech and startups, and people right. are more receptive to that. Mm. Right. Um, what do you think are the differences in all these industries, and how does that reflect in also the pay grades? Yeah, and I think I want to harken back to what Bernard brought up about the finance industry. Mm -hmm. I would say the principle about what whether a role pays well, I think there are two principles, right? So mm -hmm. one is how close are you to the bottom line of the company, right? Mm -hmm. How close are you to contributing to the bottom line and in, in like by extension like the top line, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why really good salespeople, really good marketers, I think there's never gonna be uh, out of demand, right, mm -hmm. for these people, mm -hmm. these folks. Yeah. So that's one one area, right? But the other area is like how close are you to the core competitiveness of the company, mm. right? So that's why I think software engineering and tech and AI engineers, right? They are increasingly higher in demand, mm. right? Because mm. it's really, really close to what differentiates the company from, you know, the next, the next uh, company. So is that true that you want to pick a role that is the most, one of the more important departments in the company? I would say yes. I would say yes. So in general, I think this is a good principle to, to, to go for, mm -hmm. right? But of course, there is always a variation depending on whether, which stage the company is at, right? I mean, I, I do recall at one point, we were like dying for a finance person in yeah. the company because we have never just never like emphasized on that, right? So we are willing to pay a good amount for someone who is solid yeah. uh, in that role. But also let's bear in mind that industry do transform. Yeah. So if you think about financial services 30 years ago, it was pure finance. Yeah. But today, bank CEOs are saying that we are a tech company. FinTech. <laughs> yeah. The best of both worlds. Yes. <laughs> Wait, so what about you, Brian? Like, how do you think about like your different departments in TSL? For example, like you have your writers, maybe your tech, tech people, sales. Oh, that. How do you think about this? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I, I wish we were, you know, the media was as lucrative as industry as finance and tech. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it I is. I wish that was the case. <laughs> uh, I, I do think industries differ quite a bit because of the profitability margins. Mm, I feel sure. that if you are, let's say you are f and I think f and maybe might be the one which is not so high. Yeah. And it's because I feel there's a lot of manual labor involved which yeah. cannot be replaced by a machine in some form. Mm. Sure. Whereas, most tech companies, everything is automated. So the work is still being done. Yeah. It's still being completed. It's still being done, but not by humans. And therefore, that gain uh, can be translated into like a higher salary. But it's still work yeah. being done. So because the industry is subjected to a completely different profit margin, yes. they are then able to go and pay employees 
differently, mm. which is amazing if you're in tech. You know? mm. Mm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Like one of the things that I, if I were looking for a job now, right, one of the things I would actually do is study the the profit margins of mm. different industries first of all because i think the profit margin is firstly influenced by the industry structure right yeah how competitive it is and yeah. things like that yeah. i realized this because when i when we were expanding into indonesia and we're deciding how much to price our services mm. we realized actually profit margin in indonesia across the board it's just a lot lower right mm. compared mm. to singapore right or even the us and therefore they were just unable to afford much better or higher paid talent and so, for, so therefore we have to like position our services at a different you know, segment of the market. It's like more junior, more mid-level kind of talent. But also not profit margins for today, but yeah. five, ten years ahead. That's right. That's I think right. you need to take a forecast. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So why is it based on your experience? Do you think it is currently a more employee or employer market? I would say this year is definitely more employer. Mm. Mm. Last year and two years ago, I would say it's <laughs> absolutely employee. I was, I mean, being an employer myself, I was sort of uh, at the whims of what the market was at, right? What the software engineers wanted to be paid at. Mm. Um, yeah. But this year, I think there is a little bit more options for us, right? So I would say one very concrete way to tell is if you post up a job right now for mm. a certain position, how many qualified uh, profiles are you going to get? And I would say this year, I'm getting far more uh, mm. than compared to last year. And therefore, I think there's a little bit more um, bargaining power on the employees. I, I assume this is the case across the board. Right. That's what mm. we see now. And, and what do you think is uh, causing this to happen? Why the, why the shift from last year to this year? I think two, two things, right? So one thing is there's been quite a number of layoffs mm. uh, in the tech industry. The second thing is, and this is something that we saw very acutely because we are a recruitment company, mm -hmm. mm. companies are just freezing hiring, right? Mm. Um, and if they're not freezing, they are definitely slowing down on hiring. So you stop seeing Cases where, uh, like Byte Dance, for instance, last year they were just emailing every single software engineer in Singapore asking if they want to join wow, Byte Dance, okay. <laughs> wow. including me and my tech leads. Oh, oh really? <laughs> wow. But but th but this year they really just absolutely just slowed down. I think they're still hiring, but not not at the same rapid clip. Not so aggressively. Yeah, and also I think the the hiring market you sort of see an eighty twenty kind of uh, distribution in volume. So your Shopee and Byte Dance. They used to be maybe like hiring a huge bulk of that software engineers that every startup is trying to compete for, right? And now that they have, they've stopped hiring, actually they just release a lot of supply of uh, software engineers back into the market. Right. Actually, whilst the demand for tech talent in the technology sector has come down, yeah. some of them is still fairly consistent, like logistics, banking. Mm. And if you are a tech talent looking at AI or cybersecurity, I guess that's where you try to reposition yourselves, right? Absolutely. I think I think that's true. So they are still. There's still a couple of industries for us that we see the, the hiring is still fairly consistent. Mm. Um, so what we have seen, I would say if you really just uh, deep dive into the data, what you've seen is that the growth stage companies and the tech companies, they have ratcheted down their hiring. Mm. Um, but the traditional companies, they've always been trying to compete with the, the, the sexy boys who are like fundraising, right? They have just been keep, keeping it consistent, mm. and we have companies who are like insurance companies. Mm. This year, they have a much easier time trying to hire this kind of talent. Oh, interesting! Yeah. And with all these shifts, has that changed what employers are looking out for in employees? It has, it has, and I, I can I can share from a personal um, anecdote, right? Mm. So I mentioned that we brought on a new CTO, yeah. and and one of the things that he changed my perspective about is how adaptable can an employee be, right? So he has always run his teams. Uh, at big tech companies and my impression has always been that these big tech companies they really over specialize every, everyone to do like a specific thing really really deep and really really well mm -hmm. but he has run his team in a, in a way where everyone is more flexible right, right? everyone uh, adapts to different roles so mm -hmm. it's almost back to the where you know how startups are like yeah. in the early yeah. days so we, we keep talking about hiring more adaptable talents yeah. nowadays mm -hmm. where someone can you know, shift between different roles uh, a little bit Oh, I yeah. love that. That's really cool. And is it because also now that um, headcounts have reduced, people have to do like two people's work nowadays? <laughs> and yeah. that's why maybe also? That's also part, that's also part <laughs> of the reason. So I, I would say that's where like an employers and hiring managers really have to be a little bit uh, self-aware and yeah. conscious here because uh, it means it's very easy to say, okay, you go do two people's job, right? Mm. And, and now that the market is tougher, right? Uh, that, that's what you have to go with. So where we try to be really aware is like the overall workload on this person, yes. yeah, right. But, you know, but boss, I already doing ten people job. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no chance for appraisal because no, no hiring budget. Wow. Yeah, there's a limit, right? 
Great, great. One of the things we have been doing is you watch the overall workload. So yeah. maybe the range is a bit wider, but you sort of get them to prioritize a bit more. Mm. So you don't get the, you, you as a whole team, maybe you don't do as much as you used to. That's one thing. The other thing is we, we then started shifting our compensation to really the top performers. Mm. So we, we, we also have to went, go through a period where we shrunk the team size, right? Fewer, t- fewer members in the team. But then uh, instead of cutting that budget away entirely, we did redistribute some of it to the, to the A players. Mm. Oh, yeah. nice. So that's how you sort of... Okay. Yeah. So there are many surveys done yeah. and it's actually founded that Singaporeans feel that they are very <laughs> underpaid. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right Is right, that right. true? And what are your thoughts? I can definitely understand the perception, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, last year I saw my rent increase like 30 to 40%. Yeah, my <laughs> yes. I Immediately after that, I felt underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really driven by the cost of living, right? In some sense. Exactly, exactly. So I think that really does contribute to the, to the perception, mm. right? But from a macro point of view, right? I would say the question is underpaid relative to what, mm. right? Are they compare against... Um, maybe the the parents' generation where yeah. they've seen much higher wage growth, right? Or are they comparing to other countries, maybe in the US, right, or in mm. China, where during the this whole you know, boom period, salaries were just increasing by a huge lot, mm. right? But I would say generally, I would say the labor market, maybe accepting maybe some a little bit of switching costs, right? Mm. Not everyone's like always looking out and switching the moment they feel underpaid. And a bit of informational costs, right? Like not everyone knows how much everyone else is paid. Yeah. I would say it's a fairly efficient um, market. Just on the switching costs, yeah. like if you look at my parents' era, yeah. they take one drop for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. But today I look at my colleagues, yeah, 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 <laughs> especially yeah. the younger ones. Two, it's three like, years max. Yeah, and some is like six months. Even in the internship, they say, boss, I want to try new things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct, correct, oh, correct. correct. Is, this, is this number going to be smaller and smaller? Unfortunately, I think so. Okay. Uh, and I would say, okay, maybe there's a threshold in which, below which I think it's not uh, helpful even to the employee themselves. Mm. Right? I would say one to two years when you are a, a junior, that is typically the amount of time you take to sort of ramp up to the company's context and culture mm. and start creating value. Mm. Mm. When you come to the senior levels, what I observe is that our senior leaders, the majority of value they contribute comes after the second year, right? Because right. they really understand the, the team, they started hiring instead of making that impact. So if you're staying shorter than that, you're, you're not going to be making a huge lot of impact on the company. Mm. And, and mm. therefore, you're not going to be compensated accordingly right, to that value. Fair enough. Yeah. Do you think it's driven by how youths are like more experiential right now, willing to take more risk and dip their toes uh, in various things? Uh, what, mm. what are other driving factors uh, behind this trend? Yeah, I would say nowadays, uh, the employees that we're hiring, uh, the young employees we're hiring, they're looking for, I mean, salary is definitely a hygiene factor, but they're also looking much more for the product that you're building, mm. as well as the bigger purpose and meaning, yep. right? And, and, and that's, that's also an advantage that startups sometimes have mm. because you're not working on just some small sliver in a big machine in a big company, right? You're actually making direct impact to the end users. So, so for us, that, that, has, that has been the angle that has worked for us. So at the start, you kind of sell the dream to attract all these top <laughs> talents, right? Then the question is, second year, third year, are you living up to this dream? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's, the, that's where I think there needs to be a sort of expectations management with yeah. the, the mm. employee. Right, they need to understand that there, there are some very good reasons to join a startup, but there are also many bad reasons to join. Yeah. <laughs> so, For sure. So, so, you know, expecting a big payoff at, at the end of four, four or five years, that sometimes happens, but I would say in the majority of the cases, uh, it doesn't really happen, mm. turn out that way. Yeah. Right? So that certainty you that definitely don't get. Speaking of drop hoppers, yeah. you know, I see a lot of CVs now, one to two years. Yeah. And that's not good actually. Yeah. Because you need time to really hone your expertise. Yes. So if I see uh, somebody who's applying to our role, yeah. especially you, as you talked about YC, and they are <laughs> fairly senior already. Yes. And they're still jumping with only one year track record. I, I always ask myself, why what's happening? Is is this hire going to be a good one? To me, it's just a big red flag. Yes. No. I, yeah. I just don't hire them. I don't, don't bother to interview them a lot of the times. So that's true, that's true. I'm getting very nervous right now about <laughs> our career prospect. Oh, I think I will get your number after, please. <laughs> I'll, share the, I'll share the masters in ML with you. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, but you know, from my perspective, like what YC said yeah. early on, right, it takes me one year for, at a senior level for someone to have a good understanding of the business to make that impact. It, you know, if it takes one year of training and learning for them and then mm. they just leave at the end of one year, yeah. that kind of defeats the purpose. Exactly. Okay. So it then becomes a huge green flag when you have people staying like two to three two, years, three, yes. four to five yeah. years. Yes. I don't think 
two to three years is a big ask. Yes. Yeah, but that should be yeah. at least a kind of a minimum and feel. And yeah. the market is very small. You know, you jump, how, how many shops can you jump? Yeah. Especially if you're in just like, for example, finance. On the flip side, if I look on what's the benefits, the advantage of someone who is job hopping, mm -hmm. well, I guess the person who is job hopping might have chance for higher increments mm. and more raises. So mm. they are really doing it to their advantage. Yeah. I think it's also good that they had lots of different experiences in different areas and some companies might value that a lot. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Besides accumulating experiences and pay raises, what else are employees expecting nowadays? And what's new? Like hybrid working style, can I travel, um, mm. etc. Yeah, we've definitely seen a, a, a rise in employees asking for a remote uh, working arrangement. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of them during the COVID period has experienced the benefits of that, right? Saves a lot of time, uh, get to be their family, right? So we have seen that uh, that, that ask. On that point, question for Brian and Denise. I mean, you guys hire a lot of young people in the <laughs> media industry. We all see that you know, there are certain demands coming up for you. Any you know, very weird requests? <laughs> <laughs> I think remote is a given. People yeah. expect that. Yep. Mm. And I think a lot of people, they appreciate the flexibility. And you know, some people live very far away from the office, right? They have yeah. to spend two hours commuting, right? So, I'm glad, I'm glad that, you know, the, it's a hybrid work arrangement that you have. I do feel that like physical time is also very important mm. and that's why we've moved to that hybrid model. Mm. But I think that a lot of young people, they expect that as a given, given. you know, it yeah. must. Okay. It is a must in, in any company that they join nowadays. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my company is very small still, very mm. flexible. So it's a little bit more liberal in that sense. Yes. I feel like nowadays, a lot of people, they want to be able to see the impact that they're making yeah. a lot more than in the past. That's true, yes. Mm. So yes, that's yeah. something that I have to kind of reassure my, my people a lot because I have social media where the result is much faster. There's mm. a lot more instant gratification in social media mm. as yeah. compared to community building where that's a very long process. You don't right. know whether the community is growing and stuff like that. So it's a lot about managing mm. the expectations in that sense. And letting them know that fulfillment will come yeah. in the right ways. So for me, that's something that I've noticed a lot in terms of uh, when I was hiring people and what they wanted for themselves. Mm. Yeah, that's and, true. And speaking of that, do you think more employees nowadays want more skin in the game through example equity or like profit share uh, model? Oh, interestingly, I think we haven't seen much of that uh, yet. Mm. In, 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 I would say at least in Southeast Asia, uh, people have not they really value asked cash, for yourself. Right? Yeah, they still value cash. And, and I think I, I, won't, I don't. I actually don't don't blame them. It's very understandable because they haven't seen a lot of exit uh, mm. exits in this ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. So liquidity events are still quite rare. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Brian? As an employer yourself, what have you been looking out for in your hiring process, and has that shifted in the last few years? There's this video I saw recently by Obama. So wow. <laughs> I'm going to be paraphrasing here. <laughs> uh, he, he basically said that there are a lot of people out there who are able to point out what the problems are uh -huh, right. in all levels. Mm -hmm. And sounded a bit pago, but essentially, a lot of people are going at, at that line at articulating what the problem is. And there are not many people who would say, this is the problem, let me go and take care of it for yeah. you. Mm. And if you can find someone like that, right, it is mm. a huge weight off your shoulder mm. yes. if you are their superior. Mm. And this is probably someone that you probably want to go and promote. I 100% agree with that because there's this uh, very famous HBR article called Monkey on Your Back. Oh, yes. You, you know yes. about it? it? Yes. yes. So, about how the, the managers, the mid-management uh, people are always the ones who are the most high because all your um, all your employees are giving you so much problems and expecting you to um, fix it and you become the, the bottleneck. Um, and I experienced it myself as well in you know, different companies where I have people um, that report to me or I got layered over them um, over time, right? Hmm. Where I really get progressively more tired because people just come to you with problems but right. you are the solution provider which shouldn't be the case. Hmm. Um, so, that's why I think finding problem solvers is very important. So it's a very intense, competitive employer market out there, as YC mentioned. Yeah. So we hire about two investment analysts intern every oh, six right. months. Wow, thousand okay. over CV comes through. Wow. A thousand. Wow. That's crazy, right? How do you what? pay two? <laughs> yeah, I should have used greens, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I only have time to kind of speak to 10 people. Yeah. And how do you shortlist 10 from Exactly, thousand? because all yeah. of them are equally smart. They're all driven, right internship experience. Right. So I think about three years ago, uh, there was this guy who DM me on LinkedIn and said, hey, you know what? I actually realized they are speaking at an event at Marina Bay Sands. Wow. So can I spend like 15 minutes to kind of chat with you? Wow. Wow. He was the best hire I made. Wow. Yeah. So the dedication wow. to really go out of the way to 
get time and attention and stand out. Exactly, it's an attitude, right? Mm. Every report that he puts out, every financial model he's done is flawless. Wow. So I think, you know, with people going above and beyond what's required to yep. deliver the highest work standards mm. are the only people I hire these days. Mm. Do you use some like HR software, screening software? We do, we do use greens. <laughs> yes. Wait, I'm curious, how do you, what do you look out for as an employer? I would say there are two things that we look out for, right? Mm. So it's very similar to what Brian has articulated, but we sort of phrase it a little bit differently. We call it ownership and resourcefulness, mm. right? So I have had, I mean, I've gone through this journey as an entrepreneur where I've you know, initially hired junior people because that those are all the people that we could afford. Mm. And then when we started getting some funding, we sort of ramped up and hired more more senior mm. folks, right? Mm. And I would say the success rate of hiring senior people is about half, right? At best mm. for mm. us. Mm. But then we, we also have some juniors who stay with us throughout this journey. They really grew into these senior roles and they even outperform a lot of these people that we brought from the outside wow. because they are so deeply embedded in the company's culture. They know what you guys are all about. They know everything that's going on in the company, mm. right? And we then look back at these people who have stayed with us versus mm. those who left. The two things that differentiated them was, you know, ownership and right. resourcefulness. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Have you ever hired someone who is older than you or have more work experience than you? And how does it feel? I think that, that happened around four or five years in, into our journey. So I mentioned I, I, I dropped out, right? Mm. So everyone I've hired is much more educationally qualified than I am. <laughs> <laughs> much more attained on the educational front. Um, so the first hire that we hired, there was four or five years in after we raised our Series A. And to be honest, I think when we first started doing it, I was extremely insecure. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 my biggest question was, why is this smart, experienced person going to listen to me? Yeah. Right, and I realized that was completely, completely the wrong question to ask. The question I should be asking is, how could I set this person up for success yeah. mm. and build a partnership with this person? Not how do I manage this person who has 10 years, 20 years more experience mm. than I do have. And I would say that has absolutely changed the efficiency at which I work, I work at, yeah. right? Where instead of having, I assume when I was hiring more junior staff, uh, I have like monkeys on my back all the time. Right? Everyone, <laughs> I'm just trying to like get them off, right? But when you hire a senior person, the first time I hired, I was like, whoa, this is such a breath of fresh air. Right? Because they can just own the outcome mm. and get it done. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, when, when I hire, right, I look a lot for alignment. I actually think that's yes. what a job interview is. It's an alignment test. Are you aligned right. with us? Okay. So in terms of culture, yes, but in terms of also, of course, technical skills and maybe maturity. Mm. So when it comes to like solving certain problems, yeah. Like sometimes we have to go and guide our junior employees and yes. we would spend a lot of time to even try to convince them that hey this is the you know the right thing to do, you have to do it this way, blah blah blah. Yeah. And sometimes there'll be a lot of resistance also. But it's not it's not their fault at all, of course. It's just because they haven't spent that many years in management and maybe they do not know. Mm. Right. And they would learn over time. Well, right. Hopefully most of them do. But some don't, right? Mm. Yeah. And it's so refreshing to when you know interview a candidate and the person immediately gets it. Mm. Yes. You're immediately mm. in sync. Yes. You know that you will not have any need for any of these conversations. In fact, yes. maybe there are also things that you'll be able, they'll be able to teach you as well. Mm. I think that's such a great point about alignment because I think a very common mistakes among young entrepreneurs, mm. or at least I made that mistake at the beginning, was I saw a hire that I really want based on their skill set, their experience, their profile, mm. but they were not. We were just not feeling it, right. and I'll try to force sort of that mm. to happen. Right? I'll just try to up, you know, hard sell the company. You know, mm. try to talk to them a lot more. And, and even after they joined, I also experienced cases where, you know, I sort of tried to motivate the employee to get to do, get them to do something. Yeah. Right now, nowadays, after like managing people for like the past seven, eight years, I would say the moment you, you realize you have to motivate someone more than three to four times, yeah. the alignment isn't yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And Not you should possible. think about putting them in the right. Yeah. And sometimes like if you look at founders, yeah. Um, it's actually quite hard to let go a lot of your own responsibility because yes. you want yeah. and you are used to working in a certain manner, yes. certain outcomes. Yeah. So I think as founders grow, yeah. what I see the good ones are able to be okay with it. So yeah. not particularly A, B, C, D, E, but yeah. we still get to E. Yes. So I think the good founders are able to navigate that saying, oh, give and take, you know, it's not Correct. only just one way to getting to E. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I realize selective micromanaging uh, is, is a very good middle 
All right, so mm. the comments. Yeah. Yep. yeah the for all the job seekers watching this right now, do you have any tips for personal branding strategies for them to stand out among other candidates? First of all, um, think of it as you being a product, right? Mm -hmm. I know, not in the sense of dehumanizing you, mm -hmm. right? But if you look at all the products that you buy out there, there's a certain position they occupy in your mind. So same thing for job seekers, right? When we present our CV, right? Or when we meet an employer, there's always a position that our employees will try to slot us into. Right? That is the nature of the job interview game. Mm. Right? So they're trying to figure out, okay, so there's a few different dimensions, right? Like seniority, I think you can't change that, different industry, you can't change that. But there are certain angles of skill sets that you can build, right? Where you really highlight uh, what you can uniquely do that other people can't, right? That will help you to stand out. Right? So that is on the hard skills side of things, right? You have to double down and see what hard skills you have um, that is very valuable in the marketplace that a few people have and you really just uh, put, put it out there. The other thing I would say is the soft skill side of things, right? Mm -hmm. I would say it, it is a very tired thing, but it, it absolutely does matter. When a job uh, candidate come in, they are like lively, they are proactive, they already have done their research on the company. Mm -hmm. That really gives me like two to three plus points in memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually you are a subject matter expert on branding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, but that's interesting because one of the things that I actually look out for a lot in when I speak to people or interview people is yeah. I love to know what they do on the side mm. because ah, I think it really okay. matters what you do outside of a nine to five job. So how, whether it's like, I really love it when they have like, you know, um, CCAs in school or mm. like clubs that they were part of and like that they were active in or that they initiated activities and events for that yeah. really shows you um, what kind of person they are as well it's, it makes it easy to spot the initiativeness you know the ownership because usually clubs are all self motivated yes. activities mm. yeah um, and it's also fun you get to see a bit of their personality and you see them light up when they talk about things they're interested in mm. and yeah. I think especially for my industry I think that's important mm. to just have people from all sorts of different backgrounds and have done all sorts of different things. Mm. Good point, good point. I think if you want to stand out, you have to be different. Mm. Mm. But there's different bad and there's different good, right? Mm. So yeah. what's different bad? Different bad is like if you send over a resume and it's like the Microsoft Word document format from 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, it just gives us the message that maybe you're not so in touch with what, what's going on in the world, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, whereas people send in like templated resumes most of the time they look good right yes i feel what's most relevant is, is they introduce themselves in a way in which they can add value to the business mm. right but sometimes yes. people will try to stand out and they'll talk about their life story mm. which yeah. is different but it's not exactly different good like it's kind of like different yeah. different strange right, right. right? different age <laughs> why, 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 you know why you're doing this the ones which have impressed me most are the people who took the time to go and prepare yeah. customized presentations for us yeah. so we know that we didn't just send this out to a hundred different companies right they mm. customize it there's one person who did like a hundred page proposal you know to yeah. doing the interview presented with the there's a research on our company on our competitors and what we can be doing better oh wow so, that's amazing was that before chat gpt was <laughs> launched <laughs> yeah probably before chat gpt yeah, yeah. It, it was it was now you can't tell or, <laughs> or now it's actually easier for employees <laughs> to go and better themselves right <laughs> Your chat GPT, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so those were the custom presentations, which I still remember to the day because they really stood out. Because you're not just showing that one skill you have, you know, you're showing that you have research skills. Right? Exactly. Yes. You're meticulous, depending on how mm. the research is. Yeah. And then for those who did customized versions, they showed their creativity actually mm. as well. Yes. Mm. And, and it's, a, it's like also another principle of human uh, interaction is that you are interested in people who are actually extremely interested in you, right? Yes. Like when the guy approached you on LinkedIn to say, I was going to speak to you at this event yeah. for 15 minutes. Yeah, for I sure. think that stood out to you, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Good point. Actually, Ben, you know, I have a similar story, mm. uh, but this is slightly different. Companies try to get in touch with me to like sell me products, right? Yeah. So what happened was I was at this talk and this right. person came to my talk, yeah. asked me a question during the talk, stayed out for like the whole 30 yeah. minutes of the talk. At the end of the day, they say, hello, hello, Brian, let me introduce myself to you. <laughs> XYZ. I was very impressed by her. Wow. And basically I said that, hey, if one day you're looking for a job, you can write directly to me. So basically wow. she got a job offer, even though she's trying to sell me something. Yeah. Wow. Just because I was so impressed by her commitment. Yeah. The fact that she That's would right. chase down leads to the point of just going to the event, yeah. making an impression. Yeah, that really makes wow. a difference. So how should employees handle salary negotiations so that they have the highest chance for success? I would say the first thing that you need to understand it is it is not a one-off uh, conversation. There is a whole skill that I think a lot of 
uh, fresh grads tend to miss out is called managing up. Mm. Right, Bennett <laughs> mentioned that earlier, right? It's not about being like Pai Ma Pi and trying mm. to suck up to your, uh, your superiors. It's not about that, right? It is about communicating to your, to your manager mm. your progress, challenges you, your face, what you've done, and doing that consistently, right? And I, 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 it's a skill that I think a lot of young people tend to underappreciate because they, they, they associate it with sucking up and they just like put it in my corner and say, yeah. okay, that's not what I, what I do. Yeah. But you're missing out, you're living a lot on the table if you don't do that consistently. Yeah. Mm. So if you think of it from a point of view of a manager, right? Say you have two reports. One just goes off and does his own thing and then only reports into you at the end of the year, mm. right? Mm. But the other one sort of keeps you updated of his progress, yeah. right? Not, not, to, not to throw monkeys on your back, right? Not to say, hey, I have this problem, stop it for me. But okay, this is what I tried. I have this, this different solutions. This is what, what, what I did in. What do you think about it? And they maintain that constant, consistent cadence of communication. Yeah. At the end of one year, who are you more likely to promote? Yeah, exactly. I think consistency is very important. You know, yes. not only when you're mid-year review or year-end review. Exactly. Or you want a promotion after two years of working. Exactly. So I think I fully agree with that point. Yeah. I think communication as a skill is very underdeveloped in young employees. Correct. Mm. Yes. I feel that, you know, you get an assignment, they will give you the result. Like, three weeks later and at yeah. no point doing that you know zero to three weeks do they ever check out am yeah. I in the correct direction yeah. right yeah. yes so because of this at the end of three weeks you don't get, you don't get the result that you want yeah. <laughs> yeah. they never at one point celebrated with you yeah and correct. then you have another employee who's like okay you know is this the correct way to do it can you guide me in the right direction and we'll be more than happy to go and help yeah. Yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. that communication but you know the reason why I love young people I feel it's because I think they, there's a lot of pressure maybe from their peers and whatnot. They don't want uh, to be seen as the person who kind of like sucks up the management. Mm. Right, right, so right. So they, true, they okay. prioritize managing the optics towards the peers about right. managing That's how they would look towards the managers. Mm. Yeah. So how I feel people can be asking for raises. In the past, I don't think we even had the best system and because of that, people were also quite unsure mm. where they stood exactly. Yeah. Right? So I think it also helps if there is clarity given from management or the company you're in. And there's no clarity, you ask for that clarity. Mm. So right now it's very clear. It's like, if you are at this level, these are all the skills that you need to have. Yeah. And we put it as a framework throughout our company in our mm. performance appraisal, you know, that there are nine tiers. Yeah. If you are in this tier, these are the expected responsibilities, mm. attitudes that you should have. Right. And then, when it, it becomes a very objective process, if somebody yeah. is already at this level, he, he essentially will be marked at this level throughout, right? right? It will be all green, mm. right? But if someone is overperforming, then it becomes very evident to this person himself, you know, that or herself, that they should be promoted. And in the past, we did not have that clarity for employees, right. And I do not think that, you know, many companies also have this sort of framework. We're just, we're just lucky, you know, that someone went from like a WSQ course, <laughs> like, and then we got like some new senior manager in who has experience with doing this, and then we were able to create this framework. So I, I think see. we're able to offer them a lot more clarity now. So guys, what kind <laughs> of companies should employees be looking out for? I think a lot of people should correct a little bit for is like startups uh, has been quite a, you know, in, in the news and people are quite interested in working in them. Mm. But you need to be very aware of the realities of working in a startup, yeah. right? Frequently, it is going to be understaffed, right? That's the reality of it. It's going to be understaffed a little bit. You get a lot of learning opportunities, mm. right? But you also have a higher workload, mm. yeah. right? And also, there's an ESOP component, right? But there is a huge uncertainty when the ESOP work is going to pay off, mm. right? So we have to put all that up front. But that being said, if you are looking for a role where you can actually see the impact that you're making to the company in a very tangible way, there's no better uh, place to join than a startup, mm. right? In MNCs, I would say you, you should join it to understand how a well-oiled machine works, yeah. right? If you want to be a future entrepreneur, right, you should maybe join a growth stage startup at one point in time, right? See how it goes. But also join the big companies where everything has been worked out. Mm. And then you do have to reinvent the views on simple things like HR yeah. or finance. Mm. Right? So I would say that's where you should go for if you want different kinds of experiences. Mm. Yeah. Which were the first few signals that you had to know that, hey, it's time for me to bring Glins out of Singapore? The first very big signal was our investors threatening to <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait, wait, wait. How did they threaten? Hey, guys, it and wasn't me. No, no. <laughs> wait, was it the one that said you had to go Indonesia in four weeks? Correct, correct. It, it, otherwise... It's <laughs> so investor pressure. Okay, but like, internally, do you see that value um, or that pressure to 
grow. Um, but For how sure. do you even know that you're ready? Because everybody wants to build a regional or global business, right? But yeah. whether you have the capacity or the right hires, um, when did you know that it was time? For sure. For sure. Mm. Actually, I would go as far as to say if you're an a entrepreneur in Singapore, from day one, you should be thinking about regional, right? If you are looking at a product, especially for B, B2C, right? Mm. I think for most industries, it's uh, really too small for, mm. uh, for a venture back company, yeah. right? So I'm talking about venture back company specifically over here, right? It's different from bootstrapped uh, companies. So that was, that was what our investors told us right up front. And I mean, we quickly saw the, the, the wisdom behind it. So we, we immediately went to Indonesia, bigger city, Jakarta, right? Yeah. So that is definitely the first place that we went uh, for, for Glintz. And then subsequently, after we have sort of grown in Indonesia and Jakarta for a few more years, then we started looking at uh, Vietnam next mm. and then Malaysia. Mm. And I would say where you expand from next depends very much on your market. Yeah. For us, there is a competitive advantage to being to covering Southeast Asia, mm. right? So that's why we went to other countries. Mm. But we also see another model where a company just goes to Jakarta and then expand to other cities mm. uh, around around Jakarta. So that 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 works for their business model. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great to see that it's such a well thought through plan yeah. because there's always a red flag for me when I see a business plan that says we want to go into five markets want to have three different products in the next one year. Right. Oh. As you all know, it's a yeah. slog, right? It's the nuances to enter market. and penetrate each market is so different, right? Especially in yeah. Southeast Asia instead of Europe where everything is very standardised. But right. here, you have to probably tailor a lot of things very differently. Yeah, so the SE test for me is that can you actually even get like 15 to 20% market share? Mm. Right. And kind of at least have a stabilised approach. And when you're looking at markets, are there any very strategic markets that you can copy and paste? Yes. I know Van said yes. that that's very limited. But there are some that you can kind of copy and paste, and some kind of operating leverage and economies of scale you can unlock. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So at the start, um, how did you identify your markets besides, say, addressable a, si a market, right, and, and the yeah. size of the country? There, are, are, what were other metrics for your consideration before saying that okay, let's do Jakarta, then Vietnam, then Thailand? So Bennett, I think you gave me too much uh, credit. <laughs> it wasn't that we all thought it <laughs> at the beginning. We thought we were going to be Singapore and then the investors sort of forced our hand and we went to Jakarta. Sure. And it turns out to be absolutely the right choice. <laughs> and, but we were super lucky on that. But subsequently then, we, we really then just studied the market to, to look at where to go next. So to, to, your, to your point about where to go next, what we did was we looked at uh, companies in our industry that has gone public. Mm. Uh, and for us, there's like, a few recruitment companies, right? Mm. And we look at their S1 to see what are the contributing factors for their growth. Mm, and okay. a few things that th they stood out for us was they were looking for a very young and growing population, mm. young and growing uh, demographics, where economic activity was very vibrant. So then we translated that into actual economic metrics. Right. right? So we looked at the, so, you know, the population graph that we studied in geography, right? At, of the different markets. So that was actually helpful. Right? And Vietnam really stood out because it's really young so and growing. 50% youth. Or something, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, super young population. Then the next thing of like economic vibrancy, then we just translated that into like GDP growth. Mm. And Vietnam was like 9%. Right? It was even faster than Indonesia. Right? Just that it's a smaller scale right now. Right? So that's why we picked Vietnam mm. next. Do you have any growth hacks to share mm. on how you got your initial traction in these markets? Mm. I would say two, two insights to share here. Right? One is there's always... Um, there's always a growth channel uh, that's specific to every market mm. and you have to be in the market to understand that. So for instance, uh, in Vietnam, one thing we realized was that Facebook groups uh, was extremely popular still, right? Mm. It's still the mainstream uh, among even the, the younger generation, right? So then the other, the other one was of course TikTok, right? That was yeah. growing super fast among Gen Z. Mm. So then we just doubled down on these two channels to acquire users. Mm. So and it's different for every market. That's, that's one thing. Then the other thing, right, I would say is the extension of that sort of thinking about growth channels. Mm. There's all these digital channels. Usually they are quite saturated already if the yeah. market is fairly mature. But there's always this offline channel that very few people tap on. Mm. And that was what we tapped on in, in, in the early days for mm. Indonesia and got us a lot of growth. So for us, because we are in the recruitment space, we just went, we just hired a whole team, a whole army of like uh, ambassadors who just went down to career fairs and wow. just signed people up. And I remember they were signing people up on pieces of paper. One by one. One by one. Trying to, trying to fill up this floor. Yeah, <laughs> because we don't have the info. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Because yeah. as much as we are you know, hyping up tech, yes. a lot of areas are still not tech. It's yet. untouched also, exactly. right? If your exactly. competitors are not in that space. And those exactly. are the hard yards that you will be able to differentiate yourself compared to those who have not put in the hard yards. Mm. Correct. 
Yeah, so if you're willing to like go down, do the dirty work, hire yeah. people and actually execute this whole operation, then you will stand out. But a lot of people are not willing to do that, especially mm. if you are not in the market, right? That's super tough to do. Yeah. Because we, I remember what we had to do was, we found someone local who has connections in the universities. He started like signing people up to be ambassadors. He sent them out to a, a career fair and in, in Jakarta, career fairs are huge, right? Yeah. Like hundreds and thousands of people, right? And then subsequently, then he had to hire like 10 and 20, 10 to 20 like interns to like record and sign people up on the website. Yeah, very tough job, yeah. And then like, later on, we have to pay these people, right? So then we have to calculate how much to pay them. And I still remember the payment, right, was done in a car park <laughs> where he wrote down the window and people Whoa. just lined up and they just started paying Bowling them. Cash? Oh my god. So it's gosh. like a drug dealing scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, cool. so that's what we did in the early days. <laughs> yeah. And I still I still think this this will work now. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. startups are not thinking about sending people down to exactly. physical events exactly. right, to sign where at last. Do you have any other crazy stories or um during your market expansion days, um, right. say Vietnam or yeah. anything else? Yeah, quite a few. And I would say the biggest thing is that growing up in Singapore, we grew up in a, we a very very sanitized and very mature yeah. version of the business environment, right? Yeah. Where we sort of do business at arm's length, right? Uh, but in Vietnam and Indonesia, it's very different. People will give you know, benefits, right? And I, I know and corruption or, and bribes, even though it's not in the surface, it's definitely in the background, yeah. mm. right? So when we first entered Vietnam, I would say you're, you're, you're trying to struggle with a lot of different things, right? Other than trying to get into business networks. But once you have your footing and trying to enter into business networks and get into the large deals, this is where like personal relationships uh, become extremely important. Mm. Yeah. And personal relationships are built on not just time spent together, but also mutual benefits, yeah. right? So I still me- I remember meeting a very senior businessman in Vietnam. And I still remember doing a whole dinner with him. He was trying to suss me out, right? This young <laughs> entrepreneur from Singapore, how much should I share with him uh, about the Vietnam market? And I, I, I guess after half an hour or so, he, he, he figured that I was quite innocent and harmless. Okay. <laughs> so so he, he starts sharing a, a few things, right? About how, how businesses work in, in Vietnam. And basically, why he was telling me that if you want to do large enterprise deals, mm. you definitely have to be in these circles. Mm. And these wow. circles will take two to yeah. three years to build up, yeah. right? And you need to be, you know, in the sort of network of interest, yeah. right? That was as much as you could share with me, mm. right? Wait, wait, what do you mean by network of interest? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to karaoke bar. Oh so. my god! <laughs> so one, he didn't put it explicitly, okay. but one of the questions he okay. asked me was, do you entertain your big accounts? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> entertain your big accounts. And I asked him, what do you mean by entertaining your big accounts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how much and how, how late and how dirty. <laughs> no, speaking, oh. speaking of Singapore uh, entrepreneurs going overseas. Yeah. So I've invested in a Singapore founder a few years back. Yes. And they've also gone into Indonesia emerging markets. So right, he hired right. a man of 30 people. Yeah. Hire a local head of sales. Right. And he realized in one of our board meetings, he shared that my head of sales is stealing from the company. <laughs> so yeah. I said, what have you done? He said, I've caught the police but it's taking very long to yeah. investigate yeah. so I said are you happy with the outcome he said no because people are still stealing from my company and my culture is wrong so I told him say look you go and print out an A4 size yeah. and put this guy's head short go to his house and paste that head short in every other lamppost and bus stop and say this guy stole from me he worked like the magic he did it yes oh, he did it idea. and it, it happened overnight stealing was gone Wow. So, so you really humiliate someone, right? No, but point being is that, <laughs> you know, a lot of times in other countries, social pressure is actually more effective than the law. Mm. Yeah. And as Singaporean founders, as you go out and you explore our neighbors yes. and expanding our neighbors, you realize, whoa, you know. It's very different. Exactly. Look at this house is done different. so differently. Yes. Yeah. Super different. We are very spoiled in Singapore. <laughs> very very, cool very blessed, being born in Singapore. Blessed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Bennett, you were sharing about, you know, how different it is to work with people in Singapore and in different parts of the region. Mm-hmm. So what is something that, you know, we can do or we can look out for um, in terms of working with people overseas? Actually, that is one of the competitive advantages uh, for a company if they can figure it out, mm. right? I, I, in fact, I know a lot of China companies are trying to expand to Southeast Asia mm. after uh, last year's tech crackdown, right? Um, but the, the bottleneck for them is always trying to figure out this piece right. of hiring a local team that they can trust, mm. right? And, and it's not an easy journey. We went through that for the first three to four years. A lot of trials and errors. And in fact, I have a very similar story uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, right? Where 
we made a wrong hire. Mm. Turns out he was stealing from us. Yeah, oh fake, no. fake invoices. Wait, wait, wait. For the avoidance of that, I wasn't referring to you. <laughs> <laughs> Different company, but it's yeah. a common enough occurrence, yeah, right? He was yeah. faking invoices up to 50k. Yeah. And oh at goodness. first we were celebrating because we thought he was like the high performer. <laughs> yeah. Turns out all of it was fake. We wanted to let him go, but there were two problems. One is the, the, the labor law in Indonesia is very uh, employee friendly, right? Mm. So it's tough, tough, to, tough to let someone go without legal implications, right? You have a very good uh, legal grounds. The second thing is, we realized that he has some powerful <laughs> affiliations in, in the Indonesia. Oh <laughs> you don't want to piss off. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to piss off, right? And so you can't do the paste the picture on the lamppost? <laughs> yeah, you miss it. You're we out, can't out do of that. the Indonesia market the next day. In fact, one thing that we realized was that uh, there, was, there was someone else that sort of got into trouble with him previously, right? And from rumors that we heard, that person's finger was cut off. <gasps> Whoa! So it was just a rumor we didn't know. But we didn't want to take any chances. Oh my we want all our 10 fingers to be intact. So what did you do about it? So we eventually had to do it the soft way, which was we talked to him. We told him why it's a good thing for us to part ways, mm. right? Okay. And eventually, through a lot of persuasion, he managed, he agreed. But did you bring up the issue of stealing in the first place? Um, we, we had to come at it in a very oblique way. Mm. So we can't just go in and say, hey, you co you've committed a crime, you're going to charge you for it or you're going to fire you for it. We can't threaten him. So threats doesn't work because wow. we, are, we are in the underdog position mm. um, when it comes to a foreign market. So we have been through those episodes, right? That's the most dramatic one, but there are also very, um, very, very normal ones that I think a lot of Singaporean companies go through, which is they try to hire a GM. GM hires a, a bunch of uh, team members. And after two or three years, you realize it's not working out. Mm. Either they're not achieving the results or the culture is very different from what you want it to be, yeah. right? And we have been through resets like that, where we hire the wrong leader, uh, we have to let the leader go, as well as 10 people that he has brought in that's wow. not the right fit. And through this whole journey, we have figured out, okay, there's a certain playbook to expanding teams uh, regionally, right? And the playbook is, first of all, you need a culture carrier, we call it a culture carrier, from the HQ mm -hmm. to be based in that, that country for at least a good two years. So that's why you send people out to this be where we, there. Exactly. Exactly. So we, that's what we did for Vietnam. Uh, we have one of our Singaporean uh, early employee went down to Vietnam for two years. Wow. Uh, it caused a little bit of strain in his relationship and we got sure. a bit of flag oh, during his wedding. No. <laughs> but it, he made it work, right? So what he did was he hired a core team. Then uh, coming to the second year, he started looking for a GM uh, successor mm -hmm. who is a local person. Once you hire this local person, then you have this person shadow your original leader for yeah. a good one year. Mm -hmm. And that is where you have the smoothest transition uh, and uh, towards a self-sustaining unit where you don't need anyone from the HQ. Yeah. So that's the playbook that we have found has worked mm -hmm. the best. Mm -hmm. yeah. So YC, tell us, mm -hmm. are there any shortcuts in establishing local partnerships and networks? I hope there was. Because <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out for Vietnam right now. Mm. <laughs> and it is tough. And I estimate it will take me at least one to two years yeah. to even get a picture of what the local networks look like. Wow. But one thing that I found really helpful is you find the notes in the local networks. And, and just now, Brian and I we were chatting about which uh, entrepreneurship organizations we are part of. Mm. So I'm part of this organization called Endeavor. And so they have a local arm in Vietnam. You have to understand they are like community leaders, right? They're like super connectors, essentially. Ex exactly, right? So they know every entrepreneur in, in the scene. So you, you go to them and they are very willing to help because that mm. is part of their this part of their mission. Alternatively, with the connectors, you can try to get your global clients to introduce you. So yes. For example, if yes. you're in Malaysia already, you want to go to Vietnam and you've Correct. done a good job, they're very happy to. Because actually, yes. that's a stamp of approval already. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So we actually done a few businesses like that. So having operated in so many regions and so many countries, yeah. how is Singapore in relative to that? I would say Singapore still has one big strength, right? Which is the ease of doing business. Mm. There's a reason why a lot of companies set up HQs in Singapore, even for, for startups where there are major markets overseas. I would say it's still a magnet for talent who wants to be based in Asia, mm. yeah. right? So they still want to come to Singapore, I mean, for quality of life reasons. But you can never restrain yourself to Singapore as a market. You have to immediately go overseas right mm. from day one because the market is simply just too small to support mm. a, a, a large venture backed company. Yeah. On that point, actually, if you look at the support structures, you have a lot of incubators, accelerators, and government grants. Sure, yes. So our hardware is tip top. Yes. But is our software catching up? What do I mean by software? Yeah. I mean, are our people having the guts to go and chase the rainbow? Yeah. Right, are our people yeah. having the craziness? 
to reimagine another world. So, for example, the late Mr. Simon Hu of Creative has done that. Yes. And it's for us to push the boundaries. Yeah. Thank you so much, YC, for being with us today and sharing all your crazy stories as well. Before we go, where can people find out more about you and Glintz? Oh, thanks for having me, so, uh, first of all. Uh, you can always find Glintz at glintz.com, uh, G-R-N-T-S.com. And for me, I'm, I'm available on LinkedIn. That's all we have for this episode of Hatch and Hustle. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to give us a like, hit subscribe, share with all your friends and comment what you want to see next. And also, if you're a startup looking to collaborate with Hatch and Hustle as well as the entrepreneurship ecosystem, do drop us a note in our email down below. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye! Bye! Bye.